Okay, so this is a, this is a new unit today. Uh, we're going to do this in four parts. Today is the Industrial Revolution. And then when we come back uh, on Monday, important lecture, important lecture on the uh, Communist Manifesto, on the, uh, the discontents of the Industrial Revolution, the workers, those who do not necessarily share in the largesse of industrialization. We're going to read excerpts from the Communist Manifesto over the weekend, and then we're going to talk about it in class. You're going to print it, you're going to bring it with you. Very important piece of primary source evidence. Then next Wednesday, a lecture on art and architecture. We're going to start with the Impressionists, with Claude Monet in the 1850s, and end up with modern architecture of Ludwig Mies van der Rohe and uh, Walter Gropius and uh, Le Corbusier stopping along the way with expressionists like Vincent van Gogh and Edvard Munch who painted The Scream, which I'm sure you've all seen, but maybe you've painted it, and uh, Piet Mondrian. So a good lecture, a very visual lecture on art and architecture. And then to wrap up, uh, a lecture that in some ways calls back to Isaac Newton and the first scientific revolution because we will problematize Newton's understanding of gravity with the theories of relativity of Albert Einstein and we will go inside the world of the atom and learn about quantum mechanics and subatomic physics. Then we'll have a review day and then we'll have an exam. The exam will be half essay, uh, it will be a hundred point essay this time, and then a hundred point multiple choice. So we'll do that I think on the uh, 19th. Maybe a different day. I'm not sure. Whatever the syllabus says, the calendar says, that's when the exam is. Trust that uh, when in doubt. Um, so we're going to begin today with a building and an event. A building of iron and glass constructed almost overnight by Joseph Paxton in Hyde Park in the middle of London. It becomes known as the Crystal Palace. A building that, whose construction would have been unthinkable at the beginning of the 19th century is an easily uh, achieved reality in the middle of the 19th century. And this building is constructed to house an exhibition. An exhibition devised by Queen Victoria's husband, Prince Albert. A great exhibition. In the year is 1851, and he addresses the uh, assembled masses at the opening of the exhibition in May of 1851 and says that the distances which separated different nations are rapidly vanishing before the achievements of modern invention. And we can reverse them with incredible ease. Thought is communicated by the power of lightning. The products of all quarters of the globe are placed at our disposal and we have only to choose which is the best and cheapest the powers of production are entrusted to the stimulus of competition and capital. Gentlemen, the exhibition of 1851 is to give us a true test and a living picture of the point of development at which the whole of mankind has arrived in this great task, and a new starting point from which all nations will be able to direct their further exertions. This exhibition of 1851, this great exhibition, as it becomes known, is the first World's Fair. Uh, uh, an omnipresent phenomenon in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, they've really died out, but whose memory survives in things like the Consumer Electronics Show every year in Las Vegas. It was a chance for England to show off its industrialized nature, to show off its abilities to master nature by its steam engines and iron works. Paxton's beautiful building won the hearts of the nation. It was opened by the Queen and Prince Albert on the 1st of May, 1851, and instantly became known as the Crystal Palace. 
far as the public is concerned, it was architecturally magical. It was such a marvelous building, it was so unlike anything that anybody had seen before. That in itself, I think, set the thing off on a marvelous passage. For the first time, the Victorians saw their brave new world on show, with all its novelty and invention, and they were bewitched. impact, everyone was excited to see this whole building and what was contained with inside it. Within three months, over six million people visited, and we consider the London population at times just over two million, that shows it has a tremendous international impact. But it was the achievements of British industry that entranced the crowds who flocked to the Crystal Palace. The great exhibition was Britain's show. No other country came close in the production of steam engines, machine tools, the symbols of industrial might. You go in and you see all these wonderful letters, all of these inventions, all this evidence of British ingenuity. Uh, and, and of British energy, and it's an advertisement to the world uh, which says this is the most progressive nation in the world. Look what it's produced. Isn't this marvelous? The Crystal Palace achieved all that Prince Albert had hoped for and more. It convinced millions of ordinary people that the new technology could deliver a golden future not just for the rich and privileged, but for them all. It fired an enormous sense of patriotism and pride in the monarchy. But it also provoked feelings of national supremacy, a growing conviction that with such engines of power, the British could conquer the world. It happens just 36 years after the Battle of Waterloo, but the world has changed radically in those 36 years. And if you had to put uh, a starting point on this industrial revolution, I would put it underground. England is very blessed with natural resources found underground. Metals like tin and iron, coal, etc. As far back as the 8th and 9th centuries BC, almost 3,000 years ago, Phoenicians came from what is today Lebanon to mine tin in the British Isles to take back to the Mediterranean to combine with copper to make bronze for their weapons. But have you ever been to, how many people have been to a cave like Lure Caverns or Carlsbad? Many people, but I love caves. But there's a lot of uh, moisture down there. There's a lot of water as you dig down. So the problem is, how do you get that water? out of the way. You have to pump it. How do you pump it in the pre-modern world? Well, you need power. You need energy. If you're near a, a fast-flowing stream or river, you can set up a water wheel and run a pump using the power of the water. Well, what if you're not near a uh, body of water? Well, you can set up a windmill. But what if there's no wind? Then you have no power. So this is a problem, and it's a problem whose solution is quite literally under the Brits' noses all along. What do the British people drink a lot of? Tea and beer. Tea when it's hot steams. And in 1712, a man named Thomas Newcomen will figure out how to harness the power of steam builds the world's first steam engine. It's a very simple device. It consists of a tank of water that's heated. The water then boils and produces steam. And then there's two valves. One valve 
opens up, lets the steam into a piston chamber, pushes the piston up. Then another valve opens and creates a vacuum. Steam escapes and the piston is pulled down. This can power pump and can get water out of those mines. But it's kind of a one-trick pony. It's good for running pumps. It's not good for a lot of other things. And so it'll be up to a Scotsman named James Watt in 1785 to take that basic design, that seesaw motion of the piston, and turn it into a rotating source of power. He used the planetary gear. And so his engine looks a lot like Newcomen's, but this arm here, this armature, is attached to what's called a planetary gear. And thus you get rotative motion. And this changes everything. Because if you've got the ability to artificially rotate a wheel, then you can do all sorts of things. And in 1807, an American named Robert Fulton will take Watt's steam engine and he'll put it on a ship. The ship is the Claremont, and the year is 1807. Steamboats or steamships revolutionize water transportation. They do three things. Do three things that a sailing ship cannot do or cannot do very well. <clears throat> Number one, whichever way the wind is blowing no longer matters. If you're in a sailing ship and the wind is behind you, you're in very good shape. But what if the wind is blowing at you? Well, sailing ships can move against the wind. The wind is blowing this way, and you want to go that way. What you do is something called tacking. You zigzag, trimming your sails as you go along, and very slowly you can sail against the wind, maybe one or two miles an hour. Steamships, direction of the wind doesn't matter. Number two. If you want to go on the Mississippi River from north to south, you're in very good shape. The river will carry you along its way. But if you want to go from New Orleans to St. Louis, you have a problem because the river doesn't flow south. It <coughs> flows north to south. The only way to move up the Mississippi in the age of sail is to get a team of oxen, get a rope, and have the oxen drag you up the river at a mile or two an hour. Not very good. Steamships, you want to go from New Orleans to St. Louis? You go from New Orleans to St. Louis. No problem. And number three, you go when you want to go. With sailing ships, you often had to wait in port for days, sometimes weeks, waiting for the wind to change, for the wind to become favorable. This is not very good for business. It leads to unreliability. But with steamships, you go when you want to go, and you go where you want to go. And by the middle of the 19th century, steamships are traveling across the Atlantic over the course of a few days instead of a few weeks. Steamships are moving up and down the Mississippi River and the Ohio River, the great rivers of America, transporting huge quantities of goods and people. But there's also an Englishman who will take Watt's steam engine and put it into a land-based vehicle. The Englishman is named George Stevenson. And in 1814, he builds the world's first locomotive, the Blucher, named in honor of the Prussian general who had fought with the English against Napoleon in 1812-1813, and who the following year would come to the rescue of Wellington at the Battle of Waterloo. Traveled about 15 miles an hour. In a car today, it's difficult to drive 15 miles an hour. The car wants to go faster. But 15 miles an hour over land was an exponential increase in speed. If you're traveling from one city to another over land before locomotives, you might ride a horse, but you don't ride the horse at a gallop. The horse walks. 
three or four miles an hour. Or you walked from one city to another at two or three miles an hour. This is 15 miles an hour, and it's only the beginning. By the middle of the 19th century, in the second half of the 19th century, trains are traveling at 50 and 60 miles an hour. And if we look at a map of England, we can see the explosion of railroads in that country. England, black lines are railroad tracks. This is 1845, 30 years after the Blucher is built. And that's London right there. 1854. The number of tracks has increased almost exponentially, covering the entire country. And by 1876, it's difficult to see England for all the railroad tracks that have been laid. To get from London to York, one of the most northern important cities in England, it's about 200 miles. And in the year 1800, if you wanted to travel overland, to get from London to York goes 200 miles. Eh, take you a week. Maybe a little more, maybe a little less, depending on weather conditions. With trains, the trip takes two or three hours. Maybe four if you're unlucky. Right now, to fly from New York to London takes six hours. It would be as if a, a transportation device was invented that cut that trip from six hours down to 15 or 20 minutes. That's how revolutionary the locomotive is. If we look at America, we see a similar phenomenon. Here's America in 1850. You probably can't see it very well, but there are some red lines up here. There's some there. There's one there. There's one there. And there's one there. Those are the railroads in America in 1850. But in 1890, those are the railroads. <coughs> just as it happened in England, happens here in America. And so not only can you move from point A to point B exponentially faster than you could before the railroad, but the average person can do this. Railroad tickets are not expensive. The railroads figure out that quantity <laughs> is the key. And so instead of charging $100 for a ticket and getting two or three passengers, they'll charge $5 a ticket and get thousands of passengers. They figure out that quantity is the key. And so the average person, for the, really the first time in human history, because of locomotives and steamships, can travel far and wide. In the world before the 19th century, most people's lives were lived and ended in a five mile radius of where they were born. Most people never traveled because it was expensive, it was dangerous, it was time consuming. But in the 19th century, that all changes. The world becomes a much smaller place because people can go from one side of the country to the other or even from one side of the Atlantic to the other in a matter of days instead of weeks or months. And so public transportation revolutionizes uh, the lives of people in Europe and America in the second half of the 19th century. But it's also in the second half that an alternative to the steam engine is invented. The internal combustion engine. Steam engines are very good at big jobs, pulling locomotives with 10, 20, 30, 40 cars, powering huge ships across the seas. But they're not very good on a small scale. The internal combustion engine, what's in your car today, however, is compact, and will revolutionize personal transportation. <coughs> this isn't actually an explosion. It's just a very rapid combustion, a very rapid fire. The early internal combustion engines were often called explosion engines, though, and I think it's really a much more appropriate name. The first successful explosion engine was built by an inventor called Etienne Lenoir in 1859. He simply threw away the boiler of the steam engine and modified it so that it would ignite the piped gas supplied for lighting. Unfortunately, the violence of the explosions tended to damage the piston and valves, and it was much less efficient than the original steam engine. However, his 
its engine inspired other inventors, including a German wholesale grocery salesman called Nicholas Otto. Otto came up with an engine that was much more efficient. His engines were immediately successful. He sold over 35,000 to power factories and workshops. One of the first Otto engines to be built in Britain was the 1895 Hornsby Ackroyd. It all still looks very like a steam engine, but it runs on paraffin, another product of refining crude oil. It first has to be heated to make it an inflammable vapour. It's a two-man job to start it, and it never goes around faster than 100 times a minute. The sequence, suck, squash, bang, blow, is called the four-stroke cycle. Otto's big improvement was squashing the vapour up before igniting it, which gave the engine much more power. Although from the outside a modern car engine looks completely different, but it's obviously got more than one cylinder, inside it's really quite similar. Otto's engines were much too large and clumsy for a car, but one of his employees, called Gottlieb Daimler, developed a much smaller engine in 1883. This ran much faster and used the volatile petrol as the fuel. It produced nearly as much power as Otto's, but weighed ten times less. Daimler's high-speed engine finally made the idea of a car practical, and it was quickly realised that cars could do some quite remarkable things. So steam engines are very good uh, in large-scale applications. Ships, trains, they're not very good on a small scale. It is Lenoir, Otto, and Daimler who will invent and perfect a much smaller engine that is capable of being mounted in a personal transportation device. An automobile a self-mobile. And in 1883, Daimler will team up, team up with a man named Benz to create the Benz Patent Motorwagen, the motor car pictured right there. So I'm going to let the uh, boys from top here in England walk us through uh, the genesis of the auto. Is the very first car ever made. The Benz Patent Motor Market from 1896. This is Genesis. And it's absolutely nothing like the cars we know today. For a start, it has this tiller steering arrangement, which is exactly the sort of thing you find on the canal van. And it also only has a single front wheel, so presumably if you're a bit too vigorous with this, the whole thing could topple over. Performance? Not great. It has a one-cylinder, one-litre engine, which gives a top speed of nine. And with a one-and-a-half-litre fuel tank, its range is only five miles. Tricky when the petrol station hadn't been invented, but it did show the world that personal, motorised transportation was possible. Three years later, the British came up with this, the Royal Enfield. Its controls were hideously complicated, but there were some good points. This had twice the power of the bench, two horsepower. The most important of all, it had four wheels. So what they accidentally designed here is the quad bike. 
One of the biggest problems with these early cars is getting them going in the first place. The starter motor hasn't been invented yet. There's no ignition key. You have to use the starting handle. And the great thing about this particular car, the Didion Bouton, uh, is that when you turn the handle, it will break your wrist. You what? Seven members of staff at the Motor Museum have had their wrist broken by this very car. Well, we don't actually need to drive it, we can just stand around and talk about it. No, 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 this is one of the very first cars that sold in great numbers. We have to know what it was like. You're going to have to get it going. Uh. Having got it started, we needed to get it moving, and for that we had a copy of the original handbook, which had been translated from French, because the car was made in France, into English. Literally. For making the carriage walking at the first speed, take back the drag of the wheel backward crowbar of the right, and take completely and progressively back the crowbar of embrayage to you while you keep the direction. Hurl the mover till his starting. I can understand why this is better than going around looking at a horse's bottom. But how did anyone ever figure out how it worked? If we've established that that's the gear lead, yeah. that's the advanced thing, the ignition, yeah. that's something important. This was designed for someone with three arms and one leg. Right. When you need to do a hill start, you have to steer it with your chest or your face. It won't be difficult. How do I get into top gear? We're taking the second speed, push rapidly at the crowbar forward without brutality. When it is raised up again, it gains all its strength. Yes! Yeah! Top gear! Now do I stop? What? Well, I need to, I'm going to have to stop eventually. This road won't go on forever. Seriously, I don't know, James. I don't know. Good job. Oh, I'm gibberish. I'm not going to run with this. 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 I'm not Decided to use ingenuity. So while automobiles are possible, beginning with the biggest cotton motor bug in 1896, they're not practical. They're the toys of the super. Rich. It will take an American company. This is the very first company. There we go. Take an American company, founded by Henry Ford, to take what was a uh, a plaything of the uh, the elite and turn it into a device of mass transportation for everyone. The Model T. Important piece of primary source evidence. Henry Ford will use the assembly line to mass produce millions of this car. Before Ford, cars had been built by hand, one at a time. They've been very expensive. Beginning in 1908, all the way up until 1927, 20 years of production, the car will not change. And consequently, Every year, instead of getting more expensive, which is what cars do nowadays because they change things on them and have to retool the assembly lines, the cars get less expensive. 1912, there we go, 1912, cheapest model, $590, most expensive, $900. 1914, just two years later, cheapest model, $500. Most expensive model, 750. One year later, 1915, cheapest model, $390. Most expensive model, 640. 
Ford also takes the remarkable step of paying his assembly line workers very well. There's two reasons for this. One is a kind of paternalistic, enlightened um, attitude towards the working class. But the real main reason for Ford's decision to do this is so that his workers could buy his cars, increasing his market. Fifteen million Model Ts will be produced in the 20-year run of the car. Virtually no changes will happen to the car over those 20 years, and it will put Americans on the road. The car goes from something that only the rich could enjoy, the super rich even, to something that becomes a kind of fact of American life by the 19th. But that doesn't mean that the Model T was a modern car. Yes, it's got four wheels and a steering wheel and the engine in front. But beyond that, it's a, a very alien setup. You might imagine that the first car to get everything in the right order was the first car ever to be mass produced, the Model T Ford. By the time it went out of production in 1927, half the cars in the world were Model Ts. So you'd imagine that all the cars that came along afterwards would be laid out in the same way. Luckily, they weren't. Honestly, I'm glad this didn't catch on because driving a Model T is more complicated than doing eye surgery. It's almost as though Henry Ford was being, I don't know, deliberately obtuse because to make it move, you have to up the revs with the accelerator, which is here on the steering wheel there. Then you move the handbrake in the middle, which somehow puts the car in neutral. And then you press the left pedal. Yeah! The problem is, to maintain this speed, I have to keep my foot pressed far down at what feels like a very, very heavy clutch pedal. And the pain in my thigh is excruciating. The only way around this is to change into top gear. Now, to do that, I'm going to go faster. Push this lever, the handbrake, and this is the handbrake all the way down. Now I can take my foot off that pedal. Now the speed shoots up, whether you like it or not, to about 40. And 40 on wooden wheels in a world with hardly any roads is terrifying. So in just a short period of time, Ben's Potten Motor Wagon is built in 1896. And by the 19-teens, and especially in the years after World War I, the, uh, the automobile becomes virtually common. Over half a million are built in 1916 alone. And so the world becomes a much smaller place because of steam engines and the internal combustion engine. The ability of people to travel becomes much easier and, importantly, much, much cheaper. But the world also becomes a smaller place because of telecommunications. In 1844, an American, Samuel Morse, discovers a way to transmit messages using electricity, the telegraph. You need a wire, and two re a sender and a receiver, and as long as you can make that wire is as far as you can send that message. It's very simple messages, a series of dots and dashes, stand in for letters of the alphabet, also known as Morse code, developed by Samuel Morse. And so you send messages one letter at a time, very laborious, kind of like text messages. You can't be very verbose. You've got to be to the point with the telegraph. But a Scotsman, a generation later in 1876, while working on an improvement to the telegraph, will discover a means to transmit voice over those self-same wires that had carried the electrical impulses of the telegraph. Alexander Graham Bell. And so in the second half of the 19th century, you can get a message from 
New York to Richmond in seconds, instantaneously, that would have taken in the first half of the 19th century a messenger on a horse carrying a note that could take a week or more. And by the end of the 19th century, transatlantic cables make communication between England and America possible instantaneously. One of the reasons why the British were unsuccessful in subduing our rebellion is because it took three plus weeks to get a message from London to the colonies. And then another three plus weeks to get a message from the colonies back to London. That 4,000 miles of ocean was an insurmountable uh, obstacle. But with the telegraph and the telephone, you can communicate over vast distances instantaneously. The world becomes a much, much smaller place. And information can be transmitted over long distances so that news becomes timely. The first newspapers are printed in England in the late 1600s. But without mechanical printing presses powered by steam engines, the newspaper publishers can only print a few dozen copies of each paper. And so they're distributed to the coffee houses spread throughout London and the country. And people go to the coffee house to get coffee and read the news. But it's not very timely news because information coming in from far afield is weeks if not months old. But with the telegraph and the telephone combined with steam engines powering printing presses, newspapers can go from printing hundreds of copies a day to hundreds of thousands of copies a day and deliver news from all corners of the world that is timely. And it's so in the middle of the 19th century, the three great American newspapers are founded. In 47, the Chicago Tribune, four years later, the New York Times, and then in 1877, the Washington Post. News becomes a commodity that is increasingly important in this interconnected modern world of the late 19th century. But telephones and telegraphs need wires. You have to physically run a wire from point A to point B to get that news, that information from point A to point B. But at the end of the 19th century, a method for delivering information without wires is invented. By whom is a matter of debate. Some people say Nikola Tesla. Some people say the Italian Guglielmo Marco. We will say they both did, because it's a debate that has no clear answer. Wireless telegraphy, wireless communication, will revolutionize the world. But it's not commercialized initially. It's not until the years after World War I that radio is commercialized. And it will revolutionize the entertainment and news uh, experience of the average person. The first company founded to build radios is the Radio Corporation of America, founded one year after the end of World War I, better known as RCA, which is still around today, building uh, consumer electronics. The following year, the world's first radio station goes on the air out of Pittsburgh, KDKA, which is still on the air to this day, coming up on its 100th anniversary. Anybody here from Pittsburgh? Yeah, KDKA still exists, world's oldest radio station. Initially, the radio is an expensive device for the elite, just as the automobile. But by the late 1920s and into the early 1930s, radio becomes virtually commonplace, much as the Model T had done for automobiles, the same thing happens with radios. 60% of American homes have a radio by 1935. It becomes really a primary source of news and especially of entertainment. People will spend hours a day listening to the radio, sitting in their parlors. The world becomes a smaller place. 
you not only can read about what's happening elsewhere, but now you can listen to it live on the radio. By the beginning of World War II, 80% of American homes have a radio. And by the end of World War II, virtually every American has a radio. It becomes as ubiquitous as the automobile becomes. Something that had initially been a toy for the rich very quickly becomes accessible to the masses. So widespread is radio that in 1938, many, many, many people in the New York City area believe that Martians have invaded New Jersey. Because Orson Welles, uh, a young wunderkind who the following year will produce arguably the greatest, or two years later, the uh, greatest film in American history, Citizen Kane, produces with his Mercury Radio Company, uh, a, a group of uh, actors who put on radio plays, will produce a, an updated version of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. And as the headline here in the New York Times says, radio listeners in panic taking war drama as fact. Many flee home to Europe. Gas raid from Mars. Phone call swamp police and broadcast of Wells' fantasy. The power of this medium is really undeniable. And this newspaper head, uh, front page uh, is also a harbinger of what we'll be talking about after this exam. Ousted Jews find refuge in Poland after border stay. The First World War is just one year away when Orson Welles broadcasts War of the Worlds. So what have we learned here? Well, we began with a really a pre-industrial world. The world in 1800 looked a lot like the world in 1700, looked a lot like the world in 1600, 1500, 1400. Only the fashions had changed. The basic facts of life were virtually the same. But the world in 1900 looks nothing like the world in 1800. There's mass communication in the form of the telegraph and the telephone, and the, uh, the radio is already extant. You have the ability to move all around the country on trains and all around the world on steamships. The great ocean liners, like the Titanic, will be making regular transits across the Atlantic by the 1890s. It becomes a, a trip that takes a few days instead of a few weeks, and personal transportation becomes a reality with Henry Ford and the Model T. Are there any questions about this uh, revolution in transportation and communication? The world has become exponentially smaller in a very short period of time. But not everyone is thrilled with industrialization. And so on Monday, we'll look at the flip side to this. We'll look at the factories, and we'll look at the people who work in those factories. So you have an important piece of primary source evidence, excerpts from a pamphlet written in 1848 by Friedrich Engels and Karl Marx, the Manifesto of the Communist Party. Do read it before Monday. Bring it with you and we will discuss it. And to give you some uh, context for that, we have an article by Boyer, not John Boyer, written in 1998, Historical Background of the Communist Manifesto, that puts it into its historical context. So on Monday, we'll talk about the flip side to industrialization, the great oppressed and exploited working classes. So, have a nice weekend, enjoy the game. Communism on Monday.